One of the four main criteria that we use to evaluate English essays in both the TOEFL and the IELTS exam is called coherence and cohesion. When a text is cohesive, it means all its various parts are linked up and working together to form a unified whole. And in today's writing tutorial, I'm going to show you a neat hack that you can use to promote coherence and cohesion in your own writing. I've prepared a worksheet to go along with this lesson, so if you'd like to get a little practice before we dive in, then you can grab the link down below the like button. On that worksheet, you'll find basically a list of simple sentences or what are known as independent clauses. And in this activity, we're going to try to join them together to form a single paragraph that is coherent and cohesive. So the original text looks like this. Dinner is the most filling meal of the day. Our stomachs often get full during dinner. People often buy antacids to ease digestion. An antacid is a white tablet made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients. Digestive aids come in different prices from $2 to $50 and more. Rolaids is an American brand of antacid made with calcium and magnesium. It costs $8 per bottle. So a good way to think about this is to say that the sentences in a paragraph link up to form a path that takes the reader from point A at the beginning of the paragraph to point B at the end. Each step along that path is formed by an independent clause, which is basically just like a simple sentence. It's, it's the smallest unit of meaning in the language. So we want to make sure that the reader has a smooth journey along that path. Every step along that path, every independent clause should link up with the previous one in a logical way so that the reader can move smoothly from point A at the beginning to point B at the end. But a primary feature of intermediate writing is that writers will represent every little idea using independent clauses. And when you do that, it's kind of like you're creating these garden paths off of your main path. The reader thought they were moving in a straight line from point A to point B. But now all of a sudden, all these minor details are being represented in independent clauses. And suddenly, that straight path is starting to take all these twists and turns and branching in different directions, and it can be quite confusing. So the way that fluent writers control this is they make decisions about which information is important and which information is not important. And they make sure that all that important information lines up in independent clauses. And they take the lesser important information, background information, the descriptions, that kind of thing, and they package that information in what's called dependent clauses. Dependent clauses just mean that they can't stand on their own. They must attach to an independent clause in order to mean something. So if we were to look at these first sentences, first one is dinner is the most filling meal of the day, and our stomachs often get full during dinner. Now we know that this passage is not going to be about dinner, the definition of dinner and, and that kind of thing. The, the passage is about when our stomachs get full and what people do to help that. So what we want to do is take the lesser important information, the background information, the descriptions, the definitions, and we want to take them out of those independent clauses and put them in dependent clauses. So we're going to make this our the focus of our sentence. We're going to make this clause independent, and we're going to try to get this clause out of the way by making it dependent. And there are a few different kinds of dependent clauses, but the one that we're going to be looking at in today's lecture, and I'm sorry for all the grammar terminology, but there's really no way around it, we're going to be looking at what are known as non-restrictive relative clauses. These are those clauses that begin with a comma and a WH word like which or who. They basically function like adjectives, providing some background information about something in the main sentence without drawing too much attention to itself. So as you know, with a non-restrictive relative clause, we're not going to repeat the same word twice, so we replace it with a pronoun. In this case, it would be which and then we insert that next to the thing that it's modifying, which is the most filling meal of the day. However, this non-restrictive relative clause is using the verb to be, and so we are going to reduce that. One thing I always tell my students is that languages are organisms. They're always evolving, they're always adapting, and they're always trying to become more efficient. They never get more complicated they're not adding new structures, they're dropping them. And so that's what happens with these non-restrictive relative clauses. 
as they become more and more common, and they use what's the most common verb, which is the verb to be. Like we're always using non-restrictive relative clauses to give the definition of something, to explain kind of, by the way, in case you don't know, here's what that thing is. One of the most common verbs for non-restrictive relative clauses is the verb to be, and the language has just evolved to drop it. We reduce it. So whenever the non-restrictive relative clause is giving a definition, of the noun that it's it's referring to, we just delete the pronoun and delete the verb. What we're left with are these two nouns side by side, separated by a comma. Comma. And in the biz, we call those a positives. A positive. So you probably know the word opposite. Opposite means these two things are not the same thing. A posit, a positive means these two things are the same thing. They're referring to the same thing. Even though they're different words, they are equal. They are referring to the same thing in the world. That's an A positive. And so a really good thing to do whenever you are writing the definition of something is not to use an independent clause or a separate sentence just to give the definition of what a thing is. Instead, you can use a dependent clause, such as a non-restrictive relative clause, which we can then reduce into an A positive and you get this highly fluent, compact structure, which keeps your focus on the main thing. It just kind of gives you this by the way information. So it becomes, our stomachs often get full during dinner, comma, the most filling meal of the day. Okay, next part. People often buy antacids to ease digestion. And then we have again, a definition. An antacid is a white tablet made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients. So if we bring these, in here, we know that we're going to basically do the same thing. We're going to turn this definition into a non-restrictive relative clause with the pronoun which, and then we would insert that right next to the thing that it's modifying, which, oh, which are, because we're modifying antacids. People often buy antacids, which are white tablets made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients comma. to ease digestion. But again, because this non-restrictive relative clause is using the verb to be, we can reduce it into an A positive. So it becomes people often buy antacids, comma. white tablets made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients, comma, to ease digestion. And so that's what we're doing with this exercise. For any of these clauses that are just giving a definition of the thing, well, one, we don't want that to be in an independent clause because it's calling too much attention to itself. So we're gonna make it dependent by using a non-restrictive relative clause. But then, because those non-restrictive relative clauses are using the verb to be, we're going to reduce them. We're going to delete the pronoun and delete the verb. And what we're left with is an A positive. The A positive is this very efficient, very lightweight way of defining the thing that you're talking about without using a whole other clause, which is like a garden path off of your main road from point A to point B. And that's great because it's keeping our focus on people buying antacids, which relates logically to their stomachs getting full during dinner. So the definition of dinner is made dependent. We're not focusing on that. And what we're focusing on is people buying this medication to help them with digestion. Can I give you another tip? Are you ready? Okay. Another great way to promote coherence and cohesion in your writing is to organize the information in your sentences from old to new. Old information at the beginning of the sentence, new information at the end. By old information, what I mean is something that is recoverable from earlier in the text. It's something that has already been mentioned, something that the reader already knows. And so what we do is we want to organize the information in our sentence so that anything that has already been mentioned, anything that is recoverable from up the page, we want that to be at the beginning of the sentence. And any new information, any new things that haven't been mentioned before, we're going to put that at the end of the sentence, because that is going to make it a lot easier for the reader to take in the information. I mean, the way this works is like when you're reading, what are you doing? You're kind of building this tree of knowledge in your mind. You're taking in all this information and you're attaching it to what you already know. And if you take in a new piece of information and you don't know where it belongs in your tree of knowledge, what do you have to do? You either 
let go of it and don't take in the information, or you need to hold it in your short-term memory while you go on reading. And so you have to do a lot more work in order to understand what the passage means. That can become very difficult and we don't want to make our reader do that kind of work. So we, as good writers, are going to organize the information in our sentence so that old information, recoverable information, known information is going to come at the beginning of the sentence and any new information is going to fall at the end of the sentence. Our stomachs often get full during dinner and then this definition of dinner is on the end here. But we're beginning with people here. And that's kind of strange because we haven't talked about people. We're basically putting new information at the beginning of the sentence. And then we have old information. That is our stomachs getting full and easing digestion. Easing digestion, that links up more logically with the previous sentence. So it would be a lot better if we could take this infinitive clause and put it at the beginning of the sentence. To ease digestion, people often buy antacids, white tablets made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients. And now we have uh, digestive aids come in different prices from $2 to $50 and more. I think that's fine. We don't want this sentence to be floating around on its own. Again, because cohesion is talking about the internal structure of a text. So we want to make sure that this piece is linked to the other pieces. So how can we do that? What's its relationship to the sentences around it? Antacids is a member of the class digestive aids. And since we're moving up the taxonomy, we can represent this relationship using the determiner such. Such digestive aids as the ones as the one that I just mentioned. Those and other ones such digestive aids come in different prices from $2 to $50 and more. And then up here, we have an example of those digestive aids, uh, the brand Rolaids. So again, we have a definition that's using the verb to be, and we have the verb here cost. And because we were just talking about price over here, it's logical that we would make this the focus of our sentence, and then this we would turn into a dependent clause. So Rolaids, comma. which is an American brand of antacid, comma, comma, costs $8 a bottle. And again, because that's using the verb to be, we will reduce it. So Rolaids, comma, an American brand of antacid, comma, costs $8 a bottle. What's the relationship between Rolaids and digestive aids? Rolaids is an example. So what we could do is put for example here, and that shows the reader that this sentence is in a relationship of exemplification, that's what it's called, giving an example is exemplification, with this previous sentence. And so altogether that becomes, our stomachs often get full during dinner, comma, the most filling meal of the day. To ease digestion, people often buy antacids, white tablets made from minerals, salts, and other ingredients. Such digestive aids come in different prices from $2 to $50 and more. For example, Rolaids, comma, an American brand of antacid made with calcium and magnesium, comma, costs $8 a bottle. The last step of making sure that we have a cohesive paragraph is to make sure that it opens with a strong topic sentence. And that's why you need to check out this video right here, because it's going to show you everything you need to know about writing a strong topic sentence for your paragraph. So be sure to go check it out.